You know what? Thanks, Marcy. This is why she's our media director. We are now live on YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are live. So today's topic, Intercoin Show, is going to talk about the New York City coin. Uh, we just heard last week Eric Adams, uh, incoming mayor of New York City, we're talking about Eric Adams wants to create a New York City cryptocurrency. So we're going to talk about local currencies, what that means, how they can help the local community, and how Intercoin can play a big role in making that happen. So we just got through the introductions I have with me today. Pretty much a lot of ladies from the team, also Norman. We've got Marcilda. Marcy is our media director. We've got um, Stacy, who's building up our community. We've got Elena, who's helping the Intercoin ambassadors around the world come aboard in partnerships. We've got Norman, our team manager. We've got a lot of the other people as well. Some of our investors are here, some new people. So definitely, um, if you have questions, just feel free to uh, use your mic and, and ask. All right, let's begin. So local coins, what are they about? So there's something called complementary currencies. Uh, this is just a technical term. Basically, they are currency or medium of exchange that is not necessarily a national currency, but is thought of as supplementing or complementing the national currency. They're usually not legal tender, which means if you have a debt and you offer the local currency and may not be accepted, they may actually want the national currency. And their use is based on agreement between the partners. So in a way, this should be really attractive to libertarians because there is no government mandating that you must use the currency. But at the same time, even though it's completely voluntary, the government can offer to accept it for taxes and tolls and fees and all kinds of things that you would normally pay to get on the bus or to pay your local city taxes. So local currencies have been around for a long time. And in fact, if you look, you know, they've been around in Vorgel, Austria, for example, where here uh, Vorgel was a site of the miracle of Vorgel during the Great Depression. This was a time when a lot of national currencies, I, you could say failed. Um, the banks issue currencies when businesses get loans. And a lot of the legal tender is actually issued and originated by banks underwriting these loans. And so during the Great Depression, a lot of what happened in the United States is that um, farmers had to lay off a lot of workers. Much of it had to do with automation because farmers were able to actually become much more efficient and a lot more food was produced than before. And you would think that's a good thing. But the way the economy works is that if people don't get paid, then people don't spend that money back into the economy. And so the farm hands who were then laid off went and worked into, in the cities. So if you read uh, books like Grapes of Wrath, for example, um, by John Steinbeck, pretty much any book by John Steinbeck is talking about people leaving uh, the farms and going into the cities. It took about 10 years for the cities to build up an industrial economy with factories and things like that. So in a way, automation led to a lot of people getting laid off. And people getting laid off with no money means that they can't repay loans, they can't spend money back into the economy, they can't go to, say, a restaurant or a barbershop. And so those businesses, in turn, would have to lay off their workers. So during the Great Depression, about one third of all banks failed uh, during the Great Depression. Um, or we should say that we lost about one third of the money supply. I don't know. Uh, yeah, one third of all U.S. banks failed. And this is when we instituted things like the FDIC um, and other ways to sort of help people. But so what happened was that during this time that there was a big cash crunch, one place in Austria, which is another country, obviously, but the Great Depression had affected many people around the world issued its own money supply. And it turns out that this money supply, because it was losing value over time, which is something called demurrage. Demurrage is when um, the cost associated with something, uh, essentially, uh, it costs you money 
to hold this money. So people try to get rid of it. They try to spend it back into the economy. And what people did is actually um, uh, the experiment resulted in a growth of employment and meant that the local government projects, such as how new houses, reservoirs, etc., could all be completed because the people paid their taxes. In fact, they pretty much paid down their taxes during what was otherwise a depression all around them. And you can see similar things um, in the free banking era in the United States, where uh, essentially each of these banks um, locally were able to issue their own bank notes against their own deposits of gold and silver. So they didn't trade one for one, and their value mostly depended on the size of the issuing bank. It kind of reminds you of cryptocurrencies today. So all these um, things, you know, have been tried in the past where banks would issue their own currencies. Locally, they would circulate. And obviously, there was no internet. You couldn't just wire the money, although you might say that wiring money comes from the telegraph going over the wire. Uh, so later on, it was able to do that. But in this period from 1837 to 1863, what, what happened was the free banking era is that the national government was not in the business of regulating these banks as they are today. Uh, instead, the states chartered and regulated these banks. And so essentially what happened was with these banks is that they issued their own currency. So if we go back and we look at the list of complementary currencies around the world, this is what we're going to find. Who is that we hear on there? Oh, Roderick. I think you might want to mute yourself. Roderick, are you there? Yep. All right. So uh, we've got the Brixton pound, the Bristol pound, Berkshires. And a lot of these currencies have been around and have helped the local economy. Don't take my word for it. We have videos on the site about this. So let's dive in and let's just get a little bit from about Berkshires first. And finally, from us tonight, we're going to take you to a town where they are quite literally minting their own money. This might sound like some sort of criminal scheme, but it's actually a perfectly legal tactic in one small community's battle against the big forces of globalization. From southern Berkshire County, Massachusetts, ABC. So this is an old broadcast, as you can see here. It's actually from about 10 or more years ago. And she's talking about essentially how they do it. So a few interesting aspects here. Susan Witt prints her own money. I, I mean, this is really high quality paper. But she's no counterfeiter. These are Berkshires, the local currency she developed for Southern Berkshire, Massachusetts. Notice it's, it's, it's paper based at that time. So people actually go to the stores and they spend it locally. But this interesting thing is they can't really spend it outside of Berkshire, you know, Massachusetts. They can't go to New York City, for example and spend it because nobody will accept it. So what we know is that whatever money is printed in Berkshires, in Berkshires pretty much stays in Berkshires. Tool to help local businesses compete against the growing number of chain stores. On the 20 unit note is Herman Melville. The notes celebrate homegrown heroes and the beauty of the local landscape. $835,000 worth of Berkshires were printed they're as good as greenbacks in more than 200 shops. So look what happened. Uh, 800,000 was a small number compared to, you know, New York City's economy or even the Berkshire's economy. But that amount is circulating in the city and no one necessarily needs to cash out these things right away because they can then spend it on their local workers and their local workers can then spend it back into the economy as well. This is how it works, but Sometimes the visitors and other people would like to obtain Berkshires and sometimes the businesses do need to cash out because they need to pay someone outside of Berkshires like a local coffee shop might need to pay the coffee growers in another country. So here's how the exchange works. So here's how it works. I go to the bank, I lay down $90 and I get 100 Berkshires back. Find a participating store, pay for your local chocolate and local bread using Berkshires. You save 10% and help the local economy in the process. So there's an incentive. There's a 10% savings on pretty much everything in the city. And how does that work? Well, if you go right back, what did she just say? This is what she said. 200 shops. So here's how it works. I go to the bank, I lay down $90, and I get 100 Berkshires. 
So $90 gives you 100 Berkshires, and each Berkshire is treated like a regular dollar by participating merchants, meaning you get 10% off everything in the city. Quite an incentive to try to get Berkshires. Help the local economy in the process. Guido's has already taken in 100,000 Berkshires. I've seen f faces more frequently, which is great. And I would hope to say that it was because of Berkshires that made that happen. The brothers who co-own Guido say the 10% hit they take when they convert Berkshires back to dollars is worth it because it sets the store apart from the big box supermarket across the street, which doesn't take Berkshires. In fact, none of the chain stores agree to participate. Almost everywhere I go. So this is actually a way to fight against the forces of globalization and having the local merchants being able to have power in their own community. ...to encourage startups right here at home. This is also based on local trust. And the, lo the local trust is something that's embedded in each person and in each exchange. It isn't something that you can look on a credit report for. In a way, it's social currency. And in this town, you can take that to the bank. See, so that's the point, is that they're trying to fight also the forces of globalization, which have emptied a lot of local towns. In fact, they say this in... Berkshires represent a quiet rebellion against globalization and money talks. Shop owners report some of the business lost to chains and the internet is returning. I, I have seen a reasonable increase in traffic, particularly by people who are dedicated to the Berkshires. So you get the point. The point is that you these Berkshires have revitalized some of the local economy, but if they were digital and all of this could be much easier to do, how much more can we do? Here's one more example. This is the Bristol Pound, and it's a very similar story, uh, but you can hear it and uh, with an accent from across the pound. Bristol prides itself on being slightly unorthodox, slightly edgy. People like to do unusual things. A couple of hundred years ago, we even had our own time. And today, what better thing to do than to recreate a simple, honest means of exchange amongst the citizens of the city? And that's the Bristol Pound. Bristol Pounds. So that's how it began, and enormous enthusiasm followed. A, a, a team of people arose. We've now got about 10 of us in the team working their socks off to make this thing happen. Bristol's a good place again about the way that we relate to one another, the way that we exchange our goods and services. See, it's always the same story. It's about the human connection. It's about the social and the community, which we're starting to lose in the increasingly interconnected global village. Uh, but what about our local communities? By the way, I should say that Intercoin is not just for local uh, economies, but also can be for uh, communities which are online. For example, if you have your own YouTube channel, or any community like the one we're building here. If you have um, a channel about anything or you're a celebrity, you have a community. So it's not just for local communities. But today, uh, we'd like to talk about local community coins and we'd like to talk about the uh, economics of it and how it can help. So with that in mind, um, and again, I, I want to play one last thing from the Bristol Pound video. What are the advantages of having the coin and have it circulate locally? You can hear it from the people themselves. Bristol pounds, they might offer them in change, and they can also be working with our traders to bring their suppliers into membership. So we create a virtuous economic circle. Um, but they might also invite their staff to take some Bristol pounds. If they've got printed Bristol pounds, they might offer them in change and they can also use their Bristol pounds to pay their business rates. We've arranged a system with Bristol Credit Union where that can be done. There'll be a map on our website showing all the traders who are members and what they're offering. People will be looking to spend their Bristol pounds and they'll see what's on offer, where it is on offer, and so it's going to attract attention to local businesses. Anyway, so that's where we're at. Before I dive into New York City coin, I'd like to open up the discussion and kind of talk, about, see what people think. What do you think of local currencies in general? And uh, where do you see the potential uh, for all of this uh, going forward? Um, so, you know, I've gone to two college 
right? Um, and the recent college that I went was the University of uh, Yukon. So Yukon stores, and this is like probably in a lot of big colleges in US and, you know, around the world, you have like a very almost like own town, like the college, like the campus, like in stores in, in Connecticut, for example, it almost like has its own towns. It has vendors, it has, um, you know, departments, it has dorms. It's literally like its own town. Like it's so big. And one thing that I noticed is, for example, at that time, and this was like six years ago or seven years ago, uh, the school was trying to like create some type of like coupons or some type of like point system with the vendors because they were trying to uh, improve the sales of these local vendors to keep staying in this campus because they have to have some type of incentive on top of the taxes and the rent that they have to pay, right? So they were like these point systems. Um, but now that I'm hearing more about the community tokens or the digital currencies that you can use for communities, I'm wondering if the campuses around all the world, like this college um, campuses have their own digital tokens where the members, they don't have to just buy food to earn some points to buy more food, but they can use these points in a way, if we call them points, to maybe buy books, to maybe go to the, the store uh, that is in campus or the bar or the restaurant and use these points elsewhere. And I think like is a really missing gap, um, especially for, you know, colleges and I'm just, pointing up on colleges because it's so fresh in my mind that if every college in US created their own digital token for their own campus, they can do so much. Like they can try to even improve their own local economy in a way. They can incentivize students to earn money by just shopping at their own local um, vendors. And even like, you know, as a parent now and, you know, having kids, if I want to give money to my kids in the future, I can maybe set some type of rules of where they can spend this digital tokens. So let's say I can say, hey, they can only spend it within the campus because I know everything that is within the campus other than maybe bars is safe. But I can maybe still have some type of like, almost like a smart contract in a way that only selects certain vendors that I want my kids when I send them money to college to spend them. So I think like, you know, I see like how this can benefit a lot the communities that are right now in colleges. And this is just an example. I'm not sure if you guys wanted to provide other examples when it comes to this. Well, you made me think about, Marcy, a student coin. I think uh, one of the people here actually who is attending was told me about student coin back earlier this year. Uh, Josh, I think you told me about this, right? Um, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about student coin back then? What got you excited in it? basically um so can you hear me yep yeah we can okay yeah so i went to the university of orange a um just it was a uniform one of a kind type deal and i thought it was big because you know they, they had partnerships with the university can you there. please be more closer to the microphone josh yeah um, can you hear me better now yeah now it's it's increasingly better yeah Okay, so you know what student coin was? It was it was going to help um, students raise funds um, for college. It was going to help students start businesses by starting cryptocurrency. Um, and uh, it was also going to help. Uh, it was also going to start, start their own tokens, and it was going to be its own launch pad, like a theory, where anyone could start a token to start a business, to raise funds. It was going to be like the next GoFundMe. Um, so I thought, wow, this is incredible. This is the GoFundMe for students. They could take business from GoFundMe and be a multi-billion dollar company. Um, and I think it still will. They just have to launch that. And if you saw today, it was up like 30% um, because they're beginning that process of launching it. Exactly. Yeah, I was just looking at student coin price. Today, it's up. Today, it's starting to go up again. A lot of the crash that happened after April, I feel like it kneecapped a lot of the projects, um, you know, because people... Uh, it did launch at a horrible time with the crypto market. That's why I feel like it's not huge today, just because of the launch time. Yeah, I'm looking at it here right now. Around April, it reached its peak. I mean, it literally went up about, I'm going to say, 8x from, ooh, even, la uh, even more. Um, yeah, basically at some point at um, in January was zero zero two, and then if you go up here, 
uh, let's see if I can scroll up there again. These are small windows. Uh, it basically shows up as at its height 0 0.05. So over 20x um, within three months. There was a lot of hype about it. I think there is a good potential. Empowering people to start their own currency is good. Um, Intercoin has, is basically student coin for everything, right? It's basically, like I said earlier this year, it's like student coin, but any community, it doesn't have to be for students. And then we thought really deeply in like the tokenomics of how we're going to start it. And I think with New York City coin, that's where it gets really exciting for me because I'm in New York City and, you know, I grew up here and frankly, you know, next week or one of these weeks, we're going to talk about UBI and universal basic income. And we're going to bring on hopefully Scott Santins and other people who are proponents of UBI. And they're going to talk about how we can have a UBI on a national level and how we have on a global level with um, proof of humanity, which I'm not going to talk about right now. But um, all these efforts globally, nationally, they're trying to boil the ocean. They're trying to get everyone in the world at once on this thing. And all we're trying to do is go community by community, just like Facebook did, college by college, and make the economy work for them internally, local economy. So hopefully that's going to be a huge difference. Um, and there's really a lot. And I'm going to get into the applications of Intercoin because that's where the rubber meets the road. Once we get into the second half of the show, we're going to talk about why Intercoin will actually be able to power local smart economies and how Citicoin will actually help to do that. Um, Elena, did you want to talk about uh, local economies and uh, universities in London or anything like that? You see, universities in London uh, not ready to accept uh, cryptocurrencies, but we had a conversation with Oxford uh, City, and there is a very big uh, Oxford uh, business community who are actually open to talk about it. And uh, in the next uh, couple of weeks, uh, uh, sorry, next week I am going uh, to Oxford uh, for a very big event and uh, I will update you then. But uh, now at the moment uh, on the call we have a representative of a small city in Australia and uh, he kindly agreed uh, to stay awake <laughs> and uh, to, uh, to be on the call because uh, he understands the power of cryptocurrencies and especially for the small communities. In his city, it's only 10,000 people. And uh, I think it would be great if we will give opportunity for him to ask questions uh, before we will talk about big city in New York and plans. Absolutely. Let's give him the floor. Philip, uh, if you want uh, to unmute yourself. Yes, we can hear you. Please yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I moved um, from a big city, Sydney, a few years ago into this small country town and um, uh, it was basically to get some of my um, radical life extension projects going, which one or two of them didn't really suit being in the big city. So, and it was sort of a retirement time as well. So it was convenient, but it was a, a fair culture shock, you know, getting getting out of the middle of the big city into a, a small country town. Um, but there was advantages advantages in being here as well. And over a, a period of time, while I'm still trying to get these sort of biomedical things going, I'm still involved with IT and, and, um, and increasingly getting more interested in various sorts of crypto options. And it occurred to me a little while ago that um, it would be good if we could set up this country town is called Cowra, C-O-W-R-A. And it, so it occurred to me that it would be good to set up a, a Cowra coin because like a lot of small towns in Australia and probably the US as well, the, they don't do as well economically as the bigger towns because they just don't have the population and whatever. And so the idea of this sort of, the sort of stuff that you've been talking about within the coin 
you know, struck a bit of a chord because I thought that could be quite useful. But the other thing for me was that um, it seemed like it might also fit into doing some of, you know, it might play a part in doing some of the sort of high tech things in the biomedical area that I was thinking about doing here as well. So, but I, I still, uh, you know, I still need to talk to people because I, I, I'm, I think there's a, a well, more than a few problems. Um, but I was thinking that, you know, maybe one of the things that, or one or two of the things that I'm interested in doing, I could be involved in how those um, coins get minted or something and then, um, you know, form, you know, some with, with a few other people at least get something going and then expand on that. But I really don't have a good idea about whether it'll work or not. I mean, I was a bit surprised about this country town recently because, I mean, it's a conservative area, of course. Lots of, what is it called? Um, what is the name of your city? It's called, the, the town is called Cowra, C-O-W-R-A. Um, but it's just a typical sort of farming town and whatever. And so, you know, fairly conservative polit politically and whatever. But the thing that surprised me, and it's probably a bit different in the US, is that with the COVID stuff that's been happening recently, I mean, you, you got a bit of press over there about how Australia was, or the governments in Australia were behaving really ruthlessly and whatever. But the thing was that as opposed to what was happening in the US, the country towns here and where you would expect more conservative people to be, they all went along quite happily with the um, with the pressure to get vaccinated. So, for example, this country town has got a 95% vaccination rate mm. and it's just like the middle of the city, for example. And um, so I was quite surprised about some of the things that have been happening here. But the reason I mentioned that is because I think it's going to be a bit of a struggle to get a cow or a coin going. But then again, maybe it isn't, you know, maybe there there are people here that are going to be receptive to something different, which will maybe open up possibilities that wouldn't exist otherwise. Uh, but my still biggest um, questions about the situation is that there's state and federal taxes. And as soon as you do anything that might say the state or the federal government is going to miss out on tax revenue because they're using an internal coin which doesn't you know accommodate those taxes then it'll get shut down so i've still got lots of questions about how it will work but i think there's a i think there's probably a fair potential there to to make some progress with it yeah that's yeah, that picture that you're looking at that's just outside town this this right that's right okay. here yeah, and and the one above too, which is the name of the town on the in the park there, and uh, yeah, that's all the um, canola around here. I mean, it's quite you know like lots of little country towns. It's would quite you say it's a, it, of the year. it looks like a rural area outside of the town, right? Oh, it definitely is. Yeah, so, um, yeah I mean, ten thousand people are in the town itself, but the area around the town is quite large, and it looks like that mostly. I would say it's interesting the, the sort of the interplay between the rural areas and the cities. First of all, you're right, and we get to, when we talk about the federal currency and just get into what you just said. What does the federal government think about cities having their own currency? And of course, that depends on the federation. You know, the Australian government may be different than the U.S., may be different than Europe, um, and so on. The Russian Federation and Brazil. But let's uh, just quickly. I just wanted to touch on rural areas versus the cities. It's a well-known phenomenon that people leave rural areas when there's opportunities to be done uh, to, to be had in the cities. Uh, I earlier I talked about the dust bowl, um, you know, people leaving farms because of automation. Uh, but there's also um, not just the idea of economics, but also the social, right? Dating, being able to go to restaurants, and all this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. So obviously, it's improved a lot over the years, and now. Rural towns have a lot of amenities they didn't have years ago, and so people can move back. And then also because of the pandemic, I saw this kind of stuff, which was interesting, kind of a reversal. It's very rare. Um, rural America booms as young workers leave the cities behind. 
right? Um, so this was when the crowded cities got, you know, a lot of uh, density. And, and at that time, uh, people were worried about the coronavirus. I'd be interested to see whether this will sustain itself over the next year or two, because the vaccination, like you said, um, kind of makes the, the fear of the virus. It lessens the fear, you know. Um, but this is one of the <clears throat> one of the uh, things pushing people out is high rents in cities like United States, like uh, New York and San Francisco uh, can't afford the rent and also you know the pandemic. So those things are pushing people out, but most things are pushing people in uh, to urban areas. And so I guess what I'm trying to say is when you have um, a local economy where the people are trying to leave the local economy, as we've seen also in Detroit, sometimes we've seen cities like Detroit uh, have um, these things. Uh, there's sudden exodus, a large scale migration, in this case, maybe to racial issues. Um, what would happen there? Anyway, uh, whatever the reason is, the area gets depressed and then uh, Detroit eventually declared bankruptcy um, for a while. Uh, and so, you know, these things could be mitigated by having a local Detroit currency. So, for example, if you have a local town currency or in Detroit, you have a currency and there is a plumber and there's a leak to be fixed. If there's no money to pay the plumber, right, no federal currency, then the plumber can just say, I'm not showing up unless you pay me. Right. But if there's a local currency, it can help to essentially create liquidity where otherwise there would be it would be very hard to make the the deal happen you know to get the market to clear so i think in that sense a federal government looking at detroit or looking at a local town would say you know what we actually want to strengthen the local economy rather than taxing it to death or finding opportunities let's build the economy up first and then we'll have what to tax right yeah. so maybe that's maybe that's partial i, I guess Go ahead. Yeah, I think that sounds good, actually. The the uh, Well, there's a few issues that I've got that I think need to be considered. But one of them was um, how do you actually act get around to kick-starting the thing? I mean, if you if you think about the, the local newspaper, I mean, no one reads the local newspaper anymore. If you think about the radio, no one listens to the radio hardly. It, I mean, you really need to be able to get something like an app or something, a Cowra app or something on people's phones mm -hmm. and then getting a, a nucleus of people together to start talking about the coin. And, you know, because you can't do it by yourself, you know, you've, you've got at least to get a half a dozen or a dozen, you know, um, core of people to sort of kickstart it and get some enthusiasm going. Um, but I, I couldn't even think about how you could reach out to people to begin with. But Well, luckily, we have that covered. Uh, in many of the areas around the world, we have already people using our apps. So if you scroll down on the Intercoin site and you look at this globe, these circles represent people actually using our apps. So like mm -hmm. this is replaying what people did in the past few days. Um, I have a company called Cubix, which we build community currencies around the world. And Cubix is like an open source Facebook. It's like you can think of Facebook except open source. And so Facebook was... Yeah, I've had a, I've had a look at all that. Oh, that's fairly impressive. Yeah, thank you. That's what started it all. In fact, Jason, my co-founder, who I might have on this program another time, he was always showing up at my house parties and talking about crypto and Bitcoin. And back then it was Ethereum and Lisk, if anyone remembers in these things. Basically, he was trying to get me into it. And I was saying to him, Jason, I'm already decentralizing uh, social networks and I'm already working on stuff. So I need to focus on what I'm doing. But eventually he got me to start Intercoin. We started it uh, and essentially it's a spinoff. It's a spinoff company. And so if you look at intercoin.org uh, slash overview, you're going to see actually side by side the two companies, Cubix and Intercoin. Cubix builds an open source alternative to big tech and Intercoin builds an open source alternative to big finance. So whereas Cubix lets communities issue their own social network and connect people, Intercoin lets them issue their own coin and let them transact. 
So in a way, it's like two sides of the same coin, you know, no pun intended. But mm. what both companies have in common is the ethos of open source software and ownership of your own coin, your own data, your own economy. Whereas when you go to you know, Facebook.com and we talk about, you know, the forward party who I might be talking to some people over there and all these other organizations, you know, if you go to forward party, uh, Facebook.com slash uh, forward party, right? What you're going to see is essentially they are uh, behind Facebook, right? And they only have 1.2 uh, thousand uh, followers here, or 1.3 as of yesterday, so that's nice. But all of it is sort of shared with all these other things on Facebook. Similarly with Twitter, uh, if you go to the forward party, uh, Twitter, for where they have most of their uh, people. The forward party, not only is it like a crazy username, but also it's under Twitter. So yeah, they have all these people, but if I go to Twitter, I'm not just gonna see forward party. I'm practically not gonna see it at all. It's actually gonna be mixed in with like a bunch of other stuff, right? So the idea is if I actually go ahead and look at this, where is it? Oh, I don't know, but you get the point. The point is that we have built essentially something where you own your own data, your own connections. And I just wanna play this really quickly, about 30 seconds. This is a video that we made with Cubix uh, to build community software. So here we go. This is for our clients. Imagine reaching out to your customers, members, and alumni, and telling them you've launched an extended community, helping connect them with each other, on their own time, around their own interests. Imagine if they can sign up in one click, with no forms to fill out. Imagine if they connected their address book and started inviting their friends, earning tokens in your app. Imagine if they could pay for your online classes and events using Apple Pay or Google Play, right in their browser and earn group discounts for bringing new guests. Why pay for marketing if your own members do it for you? Why chase people down for membership fees when the app can help automate it? You don't need to imagine. We help our customers do this every day. We start with your existing community and schedule a consultation with you to understand your brand and your business. We produce a roadmap for how to turn your website, page, or channel into a thriving community. We build your entire app for you, help you maintain it, and coach you on how to release it in the App Store and Google Play. Admins, events, video conferencing, memberships, payments, leaderboards, even group rides. People can meet in person or online. We help everyone stay in touch without scanning a ton of business cards. Want to find out more? Tell us about your organization, and let's talk about how we can get you to the next level. You see, so to your point, I think we already have apps in the store, and we yeah, can... I, th I think that's good. The, the the point I was trying to make is, how do you how would I actually reach out to the people in the first place? Um, I think you, I would probably have to use um, traditional sort of newspaper and radio and whatever, you know, and mm -hmm. posters in shops and things like that to begin with. But then when, say, you get a, a core of 10 or 12 people, then there would be enough for us to have, say, a, something like this where you or somebody else can, um, you know, t take it to the next level about, um, you know, in getting apps going and installing them and getting them interested in the idea of a coin for the town and the possibilities and you know just everyone tossing ideas around about why it would be useful and that sort of thing i think you're right and when it comes to traditional media i mean we work with radio shows like free talk live and we have apps that we can go to influencers around the world uh stacy you know you you work with uh, some of these influencers and we talk about um essentially giving them their own app like with their own logo uh, you know, they have their links that people want to go to on their existing site. So we can take their existing site, which is, for example, in this case, freetalklive.com, which is a WordPress uh, based site. Right. And we turn this thing into this uh, where they've got a community. 
Uh, they can meet other people in the community, in this case, libertarians. Uh, they can see all kinds of interests that these people have. So like, for example, if the, um, let's take Mark here. He is a host of the show, so he's got a little badge here. Um, he's, a, he's got quite a few roles in the community here. Show host, uh, tester, admin, etc. You can read all about him. Uh, you can share, see what kind of interests you have, in this case, uh, volunteerism, crypto anarchism, all of these uh, red uh, highlighted things we have in common. And then, of course, you can chat and you can even have um, you can even have video conferencing right here on the site. You can even share your screen and uh, and so on. My point is this. Cubix and Intercoin have a secret weapon. When you go to the local radio shows in your area, right, and you want to show them, um, you can give them their own app. You can have it so that mm. they have their own coin and people earn their coin. You see the, this number here? This is an online credits system. So every time that you go and you share an episode on Facebook and you bring other people to the radio show, right, what you can do is you can literally earn points at, at the radio show in order to do that. Every time that uh, you listen to the show, are over target and that has been the, and now they're actually right you're gonna earn credits and then you can use those credits uh to perhaps get your message across to get your ads on the show or anything else um that's where it gets really cool is that we give you the tools and if we give you the tools then you're going to promote your own currency and you're going to drive people to the intercoin to the city's currency i, I think the i think that's all really good the and I, the other thing that I've been thinking of is that um, because the country towns are sort of more depressed than the big cities or the big towns or whatever, the big advantage that this town would have if we could get it organised, if we could start getting it organised fairly soon, is that it would be the first one in Australia to to do this. And I think that just by itself would generate a huge amount of, you know, free media coverage, basically. Agreed. Basically, this is supposed to be a lot of virtual cycles that are all automated using this software. And if we can give everybody the software to have their own, um, their own community app, then we can have our own community coin. And I think that's where it starts. I really do believe that uh, the best way to introduce a community coin, like a New York City coin, is to first have a New York City app, right? Mm. So that may be the ticket. Maybe a Kaura app would be yeah. something like an entry point. Download the app, and then one day it sends I, you I, notifications. It says you got a coin. Yeah, I think that's a really good idea because you're going to have very limited success just working through radio stations and newspapers and things like that but once you've got an app going that i think that would generate a huge amount of interest and even just for a novelty thing lots of younger people would download it and of course as soon as you've got people downloading an app then all these things that you've been talking about you know are just going to be available on the app and then people would start using it so yeah i think that I think that could work, actually. Awesome. That's basically how we're planning to go to market. Uh, so that brings me to my next topic, which I think would be very interesting to talk about, is the Intercoin app. That's coming out in November. So end of November, if you look at our roadmap, come down here. We've already started the Intercoin community, as we see that's here. Um, and all of you are welcome to join, including if you're listening to this video on YouTube. We've launched a YouTube channel, which you're probably finding this video now, uh, which are you know, going to be uh, open sourced our code on GitHub. So this is going to be very important going forward. This is the open source code that's going to power the local economies, including New York City. And this is how we are different than CityCoin, as I'm going to get into now. Uh, but also, um, if um, yeah, sorry, let, let's just go through this roadmap. We've already done these things. Exchanges started to list the ITR token. That's just very recent. Literally the subject of last week's show, I think, right? And then launching the Intercoin app. This is a huge milestone that's coming up. We might be delayed by Apple because they always do these um, 
these uh, audits of new apps and they might kick it back for some changes. But November, December, this thing launches and that's going to really explain to people what is going on. So I'd like to talk about the Intercoin app and what, it, what to expect in version 1.0 because later on we're going to have NFTs. We're going to have community pilot projects like what you're talking about right there, Kaura. And then we're going to be on multiple chains. We're going to launch online communities like I've been talking about. Um, you know, you got your YouTube channel and all this stuff. And then finally, um, we're going to launch the universal basic income, which is a subject of another show. Um, voting, governance, people making decisions and currencies for real world communities. If you look at this roadmap, I mean, it's, it's intense. What other coin? I mean, this is so far from being a meme coin or a shit coin. Uh, if you compared this to the team behind uh, Dogecoin or even Shiba, Shiba is making an exchange, which is nice. Guess what? Intercoin will be an exchange, a cross chain exchange as well. So, you know, it's going to, I should say, enable these exchanges to happen. All of this is coming up, but the next thing's coming up is the Intercoin app. So let's talk about the Intercoin app and how it can help you to start your own community and have your own currency. So this is what it looks like. Intercoin app is about making crypto mainstream. Essentially, crypto and all these solutions, they come in three layers. The first is the base layer protocol. That is like, for example, Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, or many of these other ones. The beautiful thing about them is that they support um, the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. So all the code that we write that goes on GitHub right here, all this code is actually also able to be um, deployed on any of the chains. And that's really important because when we talk about Solana or others, uh, Ethereum, you know, Solana runs on its own thing, but they're going to actually bring the EVM to their chain. Neon Labs just raised $40 million. Literally, this is yesterday uh, being reported. The Ethereum compatible environment could lead to implementations of popular DeFi protocols on the blockchain. So what they're calling DeFi protocols are essentially just smart contracts and factories. That's what we build ourselves at Intercoin. So let's go back. This layer is the operating system, if you will. This layer is the smart contract layer. It consists of smart contracts that implement the reliable backend logic. You could call it the business logic. The difference between that and something like a database on a website is that the database on the website um, is essentially anyone with access to it, like I have over here, can go in and literally change anything about it. I can make someone an admin just by, you know, just by um, changing it. So this person could be admins uh, 2354, you see, and I just changed it because I'm able to log in with my credentials. That isn't the case with blockchain. With blockchain, no one has access to the whole thing unless that is the rule. Everything has to follow rules. And so the first, the, the core of everything we do is the community. And so the community contract, Intercoin community contract, is essentially where it all begins. Community contract allows owners, administrators, members, and so on. It allows you to invite people, to remove people, add members, remove, add roles, remove roles. But then you can also talk about which roles can manage what, and you can see statistics about your community. So what's important about this, and by the way, you also could see who invited whom, and you can give rewards. The difference between Solidity code running on the Ethereum virtual machine, this thing. So Solidity smart contracts applications running on top of this base layer. The difference between that and something like PHP code, which is like, let's say this code here, uh, running on, you know, um, a server, a web server. And the difference is that this PHP code just to show you it's like this kind of PHP code is being executed by one computer at a time 
And that computer is, is cheap and easy, and that's why it's cheap to access a website, whereas it's expensive to make a transaction on a blockchain. So the thing is, this computer runs it, and then it consults this database, and this database can be changed by anyone with access. The difference with blockchain is that the application that runs, the rules are baked in, and no one can violate the rules unless the code says that they can. So all this stuff about add members, remove members, you know, who has what role and so on, this is secure. And if you don't have the ability to transfer your ownership or your um, role, then you can't. Let's say that you are a manager in a chess club, okay? Uh, you can't simply transfer your manager role to someone else unless you have that capability because the owner gave you that capability or the president. In other words, we help to build the constitution of the community. So that's what is coming out. The first version of Intercoin app is going to be about community membership and roles and permissions. So every website in the world, when you go to Google Docs and you want to um, edit a specific document, uh, what's gonna happen is uh, you go to one of these documents, let's say the, um, let's say something like uh, this uh, and who can edit this thing right well google decides currently who can edit these things and you know who can view it and so i can change their capabilities because i'm the owner of this document what we're going to do is make this but for everything and on the blockchain so in other words when you have a website we're going to have like a blockchain api that's open and you don't need to rely on us like I here rely on Google. It's going to be completely decentralized and the code's going to run on the blockchain. But anything you want to do, who is the mayor, who is a bureaucrat, who is this or that, is going to be on the blockchain according to the rules of the city. And so when things change, when a new mayor gets elected, that's what's going to happen. Finally, I'm just going to say that it's going to support NFTs. The roles that you see over here, uh, launching the Intercoin app. The roles that you see in the Intercoin community app, which you could see in the applications, uh, is the very first thing that we're going to launch. Um, they are going to be your NFTs, non-fungible tokens. And you think about it, Stacy. can you talk a little bit about NFTs being like proxies for communities, like owning uh, CryptoPunk, you're kind of like a member of a community, right? So owning an NFT is kind of like a ticket of membership in a community, but we're taking it further. We're saying basically you could have membership, but you could also have multiple roles. So you can start out with a low level role. And as you progress through the community and you earn points or whatever, you get NFTs like badges that you can get. And so what we're trying to do with Intercoin app level one is just digitize that information. So anyone in the world can consult our protocol and say, oh, this person is a president of that community, but they're also a secretary of this chess club or this and that, the other thing. And so they can prove, and they can even in their wallet see right away some NFTs, which basically say chess club secretary or tournament winner, blah, blah, blah. So Stacy, could you maybe like elaborate a little bit on the NFT side and the communities? Like how, what is the scene today with, with that? Well, I've only myself been in NFTs for a short period of time, but like the very, very first thing I noticed is the community was awesome. It's very, very different than the traditional crypto community. Um, yeah, once you get an NFT, like if a lot of people will put it on their profile or on Twitter and that, and it's almost like they everyone just really sticks together. And the mentality is a lot different than the crypto community as well. Like. I find from community to community, they're all really decent with each other. But yeah, it's just, it's a, a totally different vibe than the rest of the other crypto community that I've dealt with myself. That's the thing, like NFTs create these communities around shared memes. And the thing is, I've always thought that memes are really powerful, you know, to create all these things, you know, meme maker, you got these memes on Facebook, right? Meme generator. And you could say like uh, some top text, right? And some bottom text. And all of a sudden, um, you've got a meme. 
So all these things, you've probably seen them, you know, on famous memes, right? They are templates for creating, for se sending a message, right? In a sense, they are, they have a sort of social currency and they're, they're not NFTs. They're similar to NFTs. But in a way, you have fractional ownership of a token. And the meme, the more it goes up, the more like you have that. With NFTs, though, it's a different sort of feeling. It's like there's a scarcity to it. You can't just spread the meme to as many people as you want. But there's sort of like a restriction on how many people can get it. And so you're sort of part of an exclusive club, right? It's not a club that everyone can just get into. And we've had that, we, you know, you go to the club, right? You get in, there's a bouncer, you pay to get in, and there's a limited number of occupants who can be there. So I feel like that's a kind of, like NFTs capture that. And I wouldn't be surprised if like there's NFTs for going to a concert later, for, you know, for being at Woodstock in the 60s or whatever. And that's exactly what we're trying to capture here with the um, Intercoin community contract, right? At this very base is a question of, do you belong to the community? And if you do, like to what extent does the community regard you as like an authority, right? So I think that these are very natural to be NFTs. The only difference is they're not transferable necessarily. So like I said, if you're a secretary of the chess club, you can't just suddenly transfer to the, another person in the middle of the night and suddenly they're the secretary. Um, certain things you can, maybe transfer and certain things you can't like a ticket to a concert you may resell and there can be rules about that so at its very base is the question of do you belong to a community and then we could talk about airdropping money to you and we could talk about voting which is when we talk about ubi and voting in the next two or three uh, podcasts that's when we're going to get into it we're going to talk about proof of humanity which is um uh, Scott Santon's one of his pet projects. I wouldn't be surprised if he's an advisor to them. Um, talking about the Internet of Humans where you prove your identity. So in a moment, I'm going to get to City Coins and I'm going to talk about Proof of Humanity just a little bit because they're doing a lot of the work for us. See, the work that we have to do, uh, like we were just talking about, is getting this thing in the hands of people on the ground. And not only do we need to get it into everyone's hands, but we also need to make sure that it's one person gets only one of these accounts. So, you know, in mathematics, there's something called a one to one function, surjective and injective. So injective is one to one, meaning essentially at most one person gets something. And surjective or uh, onto function is um, something that covers the whole range. In other words, at least one person, at least every person gets at least one. So one, every person gets at most one and every person gets at least one. They, every person gets exactly one. That is the goal of distribution. And so the distribution problem of having to distribute these accounts is something that's going to be solved by New York City coin, I feel, and also by proof of humanity. So proof of humanity is essentially trying to make sure that everyone has exactly one account, a Sybil resistant proof list of humans. So like I was just talking about with membership in a community, the community can have a centralized way of doing it. We don't need proof of humanity or some other project to do it. Each community can set up their own thing. Like for example, New York City ID. New York City ID is probably, here in New York City, is probably the best most comprehensive initiative to make sure everyone has an ID. I'm not sure if I have an ID, but I hope my driver's license works as a New York City ID. You must schedule an appointment to visit an enrollment center. Okay, so the nice thing, what I like about this is that if you do voting, um, you need enfranchisement of everybody. Access to being able to vote is a, is a right. And I think it, to a large extent it's in the constitution, the question, though, of who gets to vote is not so simple as being in the Constitution. For example, there is an amendment that allowed a popular vote of for senators. So it wasn't always the case. The compromise, the 17th Amendment 
uh, was when we finally allowed the public to elect someone like a Bernie Sanders or a Ted Cruz. Uh, until then, what happened was the elites, the, you know, the, the, the legislatures would elect sort of they would nominate people and elect themselves. Uh, it, like the government would elect the Senate and the people's house was re representing the people. Uh, finally, the senators got to be elected and also the president even. The only reason that the uh, president um, electors are... Uh, so the reason that they're elected by the people is only because the state legislatures have nicely given it uh, into the, uh, the people. Uh, it, 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 they, they've allowed it to happen in every state. Theoretically, the legislatures could simply ignore what their state, uh, what their citizens have voted for and appoint their own electors. And we could see that with initiatives like, for example, states uh, ignore their own citizens um, to give a voice, uh, uh, let's say, electors based on popular vote. So basically... Um, there was an initiative to try to do this, both on the GOP and on the uh, Democrat side. And so um, there are these ideas that uh, states said, oh, we're just going to go with the pop national popular vote, regardless like, of what our electors say. And so, um, yeah, Trump uh, voters tried to do this, but also on the Democrat side, there was a there's a, here we go. Agreement among the states to elect the president by national popular vote. So think about what this means. The states basically ignore the popular vote, um, kind of ignoring their own citizens' popular vote in favor of the national popular vote. Um, that kind of stuff was the subject of the federal compromise between the people and the, and the states, right? And so basically the senators were supposed to represent states. There's two per state and... Um, the House representatives were supposed to represent the people in the people's house. And so eventually the senators became popularly elected and the president is popular is sort of popularly elected by like state by state. Anyway, so my point is that if we go back to the voting ID, uh, being able to vote in the first place, right, there could be a grandma who can't actually make it out to the voting booth. And maybe she can't make it out to get a non-driver's ID or anything, that person should get a, a way to vote. And so technology would enable that to happen. And that's what I talk about when it comes to uh, in defense of blockchain voting uh, in Coindesk last year. Uh, literally, I was talking about how this blockchain voting can enfranchise so many people that previously would have to go and register and then they get off the rolls and then they get kicked off and all this stuff could be fixed. So basically this is what it's, it still needs to be worked on. That's what Intercoin will work on also. Anyway, let's get back to this. New York City ID, an effort to give everyone in New York City an ID. So the question again is who is ex excluded? Is I guess you must be a citizen of New York. Maybe there's a time frame they had to live here if you freak out the ID. But once you've done that, you have the ID. And then if you stopped living here, I suppose it gets revoked after a while. I don't know. But again, that kind of thing, membership is decided by the community. What we do is we then go ahead and help New York City to put that on the blockchain. Okay. But at the moment, where is it? In some database somewhere. And you can go ahead and log in the same way that you log in to an app using Facebook, uh, you'd be able to log in using this. So if I log out, I'm going to log out and then I go ahead and log in. Use, this is a cubic site. Uh, log in. Uh, you should be able to log in using Facebook right here. Boom. Uh, you can't uh, see this probably on your Telegram. So I'm logging in with Facebook. Boom. I am logged in. All right. It took my photo. It took my name and so on. So Facebook shares some information. I allow it to share with some apps. So same way New York City ID would be able to do that. And um, proof of humanity is just another example of making sure that each person has at most one ID. It doesn't make sure that each person has at least one ID. And that's another problem because they're trying to go over the whole world and we're trying to go city by city, just like Facebook went school by school. All right. 
The other uh, question is, where's the money going to come from to actually fund these local coins? And that's where we finally get to New York City coin. So before I get to all that, I want to pause and just ask if anyone wants to jump in, ask any questions. You see how we're going to release Intercoin app, how we're going to make sure that community membership and management of, of roles and permissions, this is what we're going to solve. Like literally this month, we are solving that and we're putting it on the blockchain and literally being a member of a community, whether with NFTs that are transferable or NFTs that are inherent, uh, can only be transferred by someone else, right? Um, this is going to, we're, we're basically stripping away and saying community is all, what it's all about. And we build the applications to go ahead and, and uh, enable that. So uh, yeah, any questions uh, so far? And Damien or anybody, if you wanted to jump in, uh, if you haven't spoken yet, you're very welcome to, or Carter. I was going to ask about the NFTs. Uh, did you say that's like uh, decentralized? So they're not going to be subject to be, being stuck on, you know, like a server, like a centralized server like Google or Amazon or something like that. That's right. So here we've got... Said? the lazy.com with Mark Cuban, Mark Cuban site. And so you can basically show off all your NFTs in your wallet uh, just by connecting your wallet. So you just click this, connect your wallets or whatever, get started. And supposedly that will uh, seem here. You've got to send, enter your email or whatever. But with blockchain, you don't have to even enter your email. You literally just go ahead and uh, connect with your MetaMask uh, extension, for example, and then all of your, you're, you're just logged in and like literally your membership and communities can be determined based on your address. So all these NFTs that you see here are being taken from the public blockchain. They are not tied to lazy.com or anywhere else. And that's the same true of OpenSea. And it's uh, true of pretty much any uh, NFT marketplace that although their database may contain some private information to save on gas, for example, or whatever, um, even though that is the case, um, they take most of their information from the blockchain, such as this NFT, was it sold? For how much was it sold? Um, that kind of stuff, it depends on the smart contract. Like the one that we've done for Token Society, when we've built their NFTs, we put it all on the blockchain. We actually go ahead and we talk about um, how much these NFTs cost and how much they were sold for. Literally, we take that information from the blockchain. Sometimes with OpenSea and others, they have that information. Uh, but typically, most of the info should come from the blockchain and it should not be locked up in someone's uh, local uh, database server. We also have Alicia here from our team. I'm not sure if she's able to speak or not, but she's huge into NFTs as well. I don't know if she has any questions or comments. Alicia, yeah. Anytime you'd love to jump in, I'd, I'd be very happy to hear your perspective on it. Um, but yeah, basically having an open database where certain addresses hold certain positions, that's good, especially if it's a public position and we should know the, the public has a right to know, right? So anyway, let's go back to, and, and of course we can easily build websites uh, that show off the NFTs. That's what we do and that's what we've done. So, you know, websites and apps, that's what we're gonna do. So step one is literally having the Intercoin app. Step two, launching the NFT Mix marketplace. I'm gonna talk about NFT Mix much later, back in December when we talk about celebrities partnering with schools and students and up and coming artists, giving them the ability to animate certain characters or do certain things, which otherwise they would never legally have the ability to do. But that's for another time. Right now we're gonna talk about membership of communities. And so we've talked about proof of humanity, making sure that each person has at most one account. Um, WorldCoin, by the way, is another initiative 
Sam Altman, oh, oh. Like, the guy who was running um, White Combinator for a while after Paul Graham. He talks about literally scanning everyone's eyeballs and giving them a crypto. I really hope they give these people a non-fungible token because if they just give them a bunch of crypto, I mean, that kind of is a waste. <laughs> but hopefully scanning their eyeballs is for the same purpose as it's a creepy thing, but uh, for the same purpose as proof of humanity, which is to say you have at most one account. Unless you're like in the minority report where you replace your eyeballs and then scan them again. <laughs> um, but the idea is that you uh, need to have at most one account. I would be surprised if WorldCoin was able to reach even one tenth of the world. So again, you have the problem of everyone having at least one account. But anyway, we don't need to have everyone have at least one account to go to a community and make sure everyone in that community has at least one account. So that being said, let's get into the where does the money come from question and how can we get buy-in from New York City to do this? So the story starts here. Mayor-elect Eric Adams wants to create a New York City cryptocurrency. He said this on Twitter because he was talking about Florida. And we should remember that Florida already had Suarez, who is probably the most crypto-friendly um, uh, mayor. He, I remember I was going to Florida five times this year. And when I first went there, I heard about Suarez. He was meeting with everybody and he wanted to see how we could do a Miami coin and all this stuff. He eventually settled on a company called Blockstack, which Norman, we could probably get into after this. Blockstack is, well, they have a platform called Stacks, which they've been building for a couple of years. And they were funded by Union Square Ventures. So they uh, fund uh, stacks. And so they're very happy. Bitcoin, uh, so basically they funded Blockstack and they're, well, I shouldn't say they're very happy because Fred Wilson pu publicly said about Blockstack that he wishes they did more. Like they put out a browser that didn't really take off Blockstack browser. And then, okay, so they're trying to like have the block stack ID. They're trying to build something for years, but this is what they've come up with um, stacks. I'm going to talk about how Miami coin has already been mined and about seven million dollars worth of STX is backing their coin. But there's no applications and nothing else besides this. Um, so. I just want to show one other thing really quickly. One second. Um, this is a picture of myself and uh, and uh, the mayor, now the incoming mayor. Uh, I met him um, in, well, you know what? I'll put the picture on the community forum later. I met the mayor um, at one of his fundraisers, thanks to uh, a friend of mine. Uh, that Norman knows, uh, he's basically introduced us to a bunch of people, including uh, Eric Adams. And so essentially, uh, you don't see it here on the Telegram, but on the YouTube, uh, you'll see uh, the live stream. Basically, this, what he's holding in his hand is the inner coin, city coins booklet, community coins booklet, which is basically this. It talks about how can communities have their own currency? Uh, so hopefully he was able to read it afterwards um, and we're talking to people now who, you know, helped. Well, you know, let's just say they they helped with this campaign. Uh, they were at his fundraisers, people like Brock Pierce, uh, for example, but people in the crypto space, uh, including him, including a few others. I, he's friends with Mike Novogratz. Um, basically, he's a big, big into crypto. And this um, proposal that we have is, I think, the most comprehensive proposal. So let's get into it. So the mayor wants to make a New York City cryptocurrency. That's great. Until now, New York State, or New York City, or one of those, has had the bit license, which was very anti-crypto. And a lot of people left. This could have been a huge crypto mecca like Miami. 
And so Mayor Suarez welcomed them and they had the Bitcoin conference and everything moved down there and the Bitcoin center was open there with Nick Spanos. There's one here too, but there's a lot of chilling effects with the bit license. And like the only guy who uh, wanted to repeal it is this guy. I, I should really meet with, the, with him. He's a New York City lawmaker who tries to make sort of um, alternatives to the bit license. Uh, his name is Ron Kim. And he's basically talking about um, how to eliminate the bit license and replace it with something much more crypto friendly. But thankfully, our incoming mayor elect is crypto friendly. And perhaps if the city itself is doing the currency rather than some you know, private company owning the currency, then the state could get behind that. And that's the idea of Intercoin. It's like we're not trying to fight the regulators. We're trying to give tools to the local communities, which are their constituents, which are, you know, part of their state. And basically just give them the tools to have their own coin. So CityCoin announced the other day, mine NYC coin starting November 10th. It's like a few days ago. Wait, isn't that literally? No, it's today. <laughs> literally today. As we're recording this, you can start mining New York City coin. How do you mine it? What is it? Eric Adams, the mayor elect of New York City, has spoken. City coins are coming to the Big Apple. Let's do this. Okay, city coins. What is city coins? Does New does the mayor has they all has Eric Adams given already the blessing to city coins to make it? No. I mean you know it, it's obviously funded by a new york city based uh, venture capital firm but uh, union square ventures but it's not necessarily officially chosen by new york city as the coin so what are they doing new york city status is a global leader matters in matters of culture and business doesn't need to be stated where nyc goes the world follows yes that's true even in the midst of a challenging year the city's tech scene has thrived okay google amazon centralized companies yes city coins miami coin has generated approximately 20 million dollars for the city of miami in less than three months so these guys are very good at getting bitcoin or whatever currency into their city coin and we'll talk about how they do that meanwhile city coins is just getting started in nyc but unlike the city's existing tech companies nyc coin is a decentralized project directly operated and led by New York City's community and supporters. Notice it does not include the officials. But this is what's cool about it, decentralized and permissionless. This means that New York City Coin is at its heart a grassroots initiative and New York City tokens can be used as the community sees fit to redefine civic engagement, fund local developments, and benefit the city residents in whatever additional ways the community wishes. Boom! The ways that we would like them to try include intercoin smart contracts this is because new york city coins are programmable and built on open source software thereby powering a new community-led ecosystem for developers to create applications and experiment with innovative cases we have created those applications over the last three years we have literally open sourced our code on github uh, and you can see those applications unfortunately the stacks platform that they built it on is not supportive of many of these applications because it's not Turing complete. What it means to be Turing complete is for essentially um, an, a programming language to support things like loops uh, and arbitrary programs. When something's not Turing complete, you can be sure that the program finishes in a specific amount of time. You can tell whether the program finishes or not. And so Sometimes that's not always good for the kind of application we're trying to do, like universal <clears throat> basic income and statistics, consumer price index, and things like that. Some applications could be built on their site. But remember how I said that everything is compatible with the EVM? Well, that's what we're going to take advantage of. And so when we talk about this, let me just quickly uh, put here, go here. Everything is compatible with the EVM. Here we go. This is the key to the whole thing. 
when we built at Cubix, we built it on PHP because if you look at how much of the web uh, runs PHP, it's like how many web hosts allow you to deploy WordPress or MySQL or whatever, right? So they run PHP. They've already installed PHP. Similarly, you know, when we uh, built Intercoin, we, for the first year, we thought we'd build our own system, our own base layer protocol. But then we said, you know, if you can't beat them, join them. And we, so we joined and built everything on the EVM, on Ethereum. And th so that's why everything is compatible. The platform is the EVM, anything that supports the EVM. This is where Intercoin thrives. Number two and number three, user-friendly app. So let's just quickly, where is this thing? Where was I just now? This. Cardano is building bridges to Ethereum. Solana is already compatible with it. Polkadot is starting to support the EVM and so on. So what can we do with Stacks? Let's keep reading just real quick. City Coins is designed not just to incentivize city governments to help support local businesses and residents, but also provide them with the means to do so. 30% of the funds spent to mine the New York City tokens are sent to a secure crypto wallet that's reserved for New York's municipal government or the mayor's fund. The remaining 70% of these funds is distributed to New York City coin users that stack NYC to that stack NYC coin, it should say, to earn crypto rewards. Someone should fix this. All that needs to happen next is New York City to accept their protocol donation. Okay. So who has it? So 30% goes to a secure crypto wallet that is going to be claimed by this guy's administration. And the other 70% is in the hands of the people, in this case, the people using STX. So how does it work? STX mining Bitcoin. It's a bit convoluted. Norman, maybe you could talk about it because you were talking about it the other day. How exactly does stacking work? Um, essentially, what, what is actually is happening with uh, miners? Let's see, stacks, miners. How does stacking work? Norman, do you want to explain this or should I, if you're there? All right, I'll try to explain this. Uh, this is too dense. Um, I'll just say this. Essentially, uh, what happens is instead of Bitcoin miners using electricity to mine Bitcoin. They said, why don't we have stack STX miners? Instead of electricity, they're going to put in Bitcoin like a lottery. One of these guys is going to win the lottery and they're going to get the Bitcoin. So if you're mining stacks, you're basically winning Bitcoin. And so you mine stacks and you get, well, you get stacks and you also get Bitcoin. Um, the, uh, as far as I understand, the people that get Bitcoin are the ones who are mining uh, stacks. And then basically the Bitcoin holders who put their Bitcoin in can win stacks. They can get stacks, STX coins. So it's a, kind of a coin swap that happens when mining happens. Okay, let's just say that it creates some sort of gateway between STX and Bitcoin. So then there becomes a, some kind of exchange where SDX can be exchanged for Bitcoin. How do city currencies comes in, come in as they, they kick it up one more level? So in other words, now New York City coin can be stacked. I guess that's why they call it stacks. And then you get the STX token, and then the STX token can be ex exchanged for Bitcoin. In a, in a way, it's similar to how Intercoin is set up in that you have the local community coin, and you can exchange it for Intercoin. And then the Intercoin can be exchanged for Bitcoin or any of these other ones. So in that sense, it's similar. But that's where the similarities end. Stax has no applications at the moment. They actually had a hackathon. Elena, what was that hackathon that you said that um, they had? Do you remember by any chance? Uh, which hackathon you're talking about? Um, Stacks 2.0 hackathon series. Here you go.
Basically, they tried to get people to make applications for them. Right? There it was. Smart contract focused hackathon lets you experiment and get familiar with Clarity's development environment. Clarity is their language. Clarity is the language that is used to build stacks, uh, smart contracts. So what did they come up with in the end? I don't know. They don't have much uh, that they showed, but they're very good with sort of the, uh, the PR, you know? But what did they actually accomplish? I fear that it might be the same as with their browser. They didn't get that much adoption. And partially that's because of the language. So this is what is important to understand. Stacks is a completely different blockchain. It does not support the EVM. So therefore it cannot run the intercoin applications. Instead, it is a non-Turing complete language that has these functions. If, then, and so on. It does have some loops like this function here, map. So it may support some things and we do have to investigate if we can um, port our applications to their platform. But here is what I know. Because of this function right here, with this long name, SECP256K1 recover, we can take Stacks coins and we can bridge them using the intercoin protocol to let's say Binance Smart Chain or to Polygon Matic. In other words, the value, the $7 million that was raised for Miami Coin, for example, that is in this wallet here that they're talking about, right? This mayor can decide to work with Intercoin and put some of those, maybe not all, but some, to a pilot to have a UBI or to have any other programmable currency because this is a great partnership. Stacks essentially raises the money. And then because it's so permissionless and programmable and open source, there is nothing stopping the 70% of people that have the Stacks coin, even if the mayor doesn't want to do it, from downloading the Intercoin app, which is what's coming out, and they will be able to essentially claim, move their coins, right? Get their Stacks coins by pressing one button and depositing their, their Stacks coins into essentially the city's wallet. On the, so you see this like this crypt, secure crypto wallet? They can, we can set up another crypto wallet that is going to act as a gateway between the Stacks platform and the intercoin platform running on Binance Smart Chain, for example. So where does the money come from is what I've always been saying is we don't need secondary markets and speculators necessarily at all. Our coin does not need to be funded by investors trying to speculate on the price of intercoin. Sure, there will be people who do that. But how about people moving their coins into the ecosystem because they want to use the utility of intercoin applications? So these are the applications that they will be able to use. And this is why anybody would do that. And then Stacy, you brought up a good point of like what happens, maybe they can stake their coins here and they can earn more rewards. So are they giving up those rewards? We'll talk about that right after this. Here is the utility that they get if they move their coins into intercoin network. They can participate in the city's governance and voting. Now, I'm not saying that the votes will be officially sanctioned or that the elections will be uh, run on day one, but guess what? The city can start to poll the population maybe about certain things. And by having an intercoin account, even if you don't move your coins into it, you will be able to authenticate with the New York City ID. We've, we've, we've talked about proof of humanity, we've talked about this, but New York City ID, you can get into the community and you can vote. Next, if we launch the New York City currency on the Intercoin platform, people will be able to bridge and deposit their New York City coins into the Intercoin, New York City coins, powered by Intercoin. Next, 
people will be able to pay each other. Businesses will be able to pay their employees, just like our business, be able to pay employees in that coin. Something that right now with stacks, you can't really do because if you look at how you pay, it's trustless. I appointed Norman, a manager, to pay out to our contractors, right? So I set a certain rate and a certain salary and there's certain restrictions. And so I don't have to keep an eye on it. These rules are going to be enforced and there's, there's no embezzling of money, nothing like that. It's basically, you know which address is going to, you whitelist everything, you have a certain rate, salary, and so everything is enforced. That's just one. Another thing is a contest. You can set up contests to figure out certain things like build a school, have paint night, whatever, clean up a park. And so whichever team does the best, like uh, for example, a sculpture for the parks or whatever, then that team wins. Judges, rounds, all this stuff is already done. That's what Intercoin can do. Fundraising. If you're trying to fundraise for certain things in the city, you'll be able to do that. Escrow. This is about off-chain transactions, things that take time. So for example, if someone's working for a project, they deliver half of it, they get half the money. Money's put into escrow. All these things, control contract, allows people to manage a certain wallet collectively. So instead of having Mayor Adams you know, at 3 a.m. decide to, you know, sign something from his own personal wallet. That wallet will likely be held by five different people and you need three out of five to sign something. So control contract can replace any address in the system with this kind of multi-sig. And finally, the reserve currency. That's the Intercoin itself. When we talk about Intercoin having the reserves automatically be managed and when people buy it back, automatically decide how much to give back and how much to keep uh, depending on the velocity of people redeeming it. Anyway, long story short, these are many of the possible applications of Intercoin, not even going into NFTs and all this kind of stuff. So why would anyone deposit their crypto coins into Intercoin? Because their coins become smart and they get a smart economy. If they don't do it, then they can just sit there with the dumb coins, which all they can do is stack them, which is the same as staking them and earning more Bitcoin. So Stacy, you had a question the other day, right? About that stacking, like how, like people might not want to give up that uh, passive income, right? Oh, Stacy, sorry, I think you're muted. You still there? Sorry, cut out. Were you talking to me? Sorry, I was saying you mentioned the other day that people who have stacks, New York City coin, might not want to move it into the intercoin system because they're going to give up some sort of little no rewards. Reward. Yeah. So can you talk just a little bit about that? What do you mean? Um, what do they get now? Well, just what I was saying was, if they're, if they're accumulating any sort of rewards, you know, staying on that system, you know, why would they want to leave and move to ours? And as you explained to me, that we would be able to provide the same. So why wouldn't they? As well as we'd also have the same applications. We'd have applications that they do not provide. So obviously it'd be an advantage for people to move. Exactly. Exactly. So basically the applications that we have, everything else, all the rewards that they're given out, they're just going to park it in the city's um, wallet. So that wallet is still holding their city coins and is still going to be uh, accumulating their rewards. So at the end of the day, when they want, when somebody redeems those coins, they can get those rewards that have been accumulating. So all that stuff can, can be done. I mean, in theory, or in principle, it can be done. Um, you don't need to give up your rewards. But what you do is you move the coins to the city's wallet. And the city's wallet is not interested in accumulating the rewards, which anyway is a little bit of a Ponzi scheme feel, right, element, which is like you're just giving out more coins in its own denomination. So where does the actual outside value come from? 
So at Intercoin, we believe that the value of currency comes from actual utility, right? These Berkshires, which I started the started the show with, these Berkshires, people spend them because they can actually go to the store and they can actually spend them. And so like what we were talking about with Kaura, it's the same thing, right, Philip? Um, people need to actually be able to spend it locally. Otherwise, it's just another speculative asset or collectible, right? So essentially, that's what we need to do is create adoption in the city. Like that guy was talking about, um, about Bristol Pounds. He said there's going to be a map and there's going to be a lot of people that can accept the local coin. So long story short, what is our roadmap to New York City coin being accepted, uh, powered by Intercoin? The way I see it, there's a competition going on as to who or what network will power the city coin. City coins have stepped up and said, we will get the value into the coin. And I think that's great. And I love that the competitors in this space are open and programmable. So in a sense, they're not locking you in and neither will Intercoin kind of really lock you in because we're also open and programmable. So people are going to choose the thing that works the best for them, just like when they choose what to park their DeFi, their, their stable coins into. Is it going to be, you know, value locked in this protocol or that protocol? And until now, most of the incentives have been about yield farming. Right. It's like, we'll give you more of our coin. If you stake our coin, we'll give you more of our coin. That's what Stacks does. They may call it stacking instead of staking, but at the end of the day, that's what it is. But that's not all that could be. Intercoin is proving that smart contracts can be used to build applications of all kinds. Making crypto mainstream requires people to do more than just hide their coins under the pillow which is what Bitcoin really ended up being as a store of value. No, smart contracts can do a lot more. And these applications that I just described down here are just the beginning. I mean, people can come up with all kinds of applications. The idea that you can manage the members of your community and make that open to any website to see who is a member and who is not, to display that as beautiful NFTs in your wallet or whatever. That's just step one. Having your community currency that you can pay out to your employees or pay out to contestants or teams entering your contest. You know, having statistics, which I, you know, glossed over, being able to have your population make informed decisions based on how things are actually happening in your community. All these things we've documented, all these things we have put out as open source software. And so essentially that's what this is, community documentation the YouTube channel, what we're doing right now. But we're going to have to step up our efforts. So as a team, all of us here, we're the nucleus. We're lucky enough to like have been in the beginning and we earn a bunch of ITRs doing it. But guess what? For this to actually take off, Intercoin has to become a global movement, just like proof of humanity, right? We're going to need better marketing. We're going to have to spend more money on marketing. We're going to have to have better PR. It's not enough that I simply, you know, get into Cointelegraph or talk about, you know, have some articles. We have those already. They're already on the site and you can uh, literally like see them right here. You know, Yahoo Finance talks about Intercoin um, becoming the thing, right? But if you compare what we do now with even like a shitcoin, like um, not Everrise. Yeah. Ever, what is it called? Ever? Ever? ever rise or ever earn i don't know um not ever rise what is the latest one that like is going up like crazy i forgot um ever grow okay oh my god these guys get venture capital now okay so ever grow is like another type of like ponzi scheme coin which has um reflections and all kinds of things but because it has so much good press. I mean, look at this. Bloomberg ever grow. All right. Uh, they were able to get this in September into Bloomberg. And all it was is PR Newswire. It's all it is. But because Bloomberg and others like that 
are publishing this, okay, they get a lot of press. They got Yahoo, they got Bloomberg. We didn't get Bloomberg, but we got like a bunch of these. We need to step it up. Intercoin now has enough that everything's user friendly. You can add it to MetaMask, right? You can literally add it to MetaMask right here. You can buy it on X markets. There's going to be more. Uh, you know, all this stuff is happening. So essentially, going forward, my team and I, the development team, is going to create the um, Intercoin app. And the people that uh, the people have told us they're going to get it to the top of Product Hunt, so that's going to happen. But when it comes to marketing, we need to get as good as the shitcoin guys. We need to get the Telegram channel as vibrant as the shitcoin guys. And Stacy, you've been doing an amazing job with Twitter and the team that you have on your side. Uh, so we're going to grow our Twitter. Yeah. Absolutely. Can you talk just really briefly about the initiatives that you think can help our community grow in the next month or two and where we could do it with Twitter, Telegram, like what can we do really um, and community forum as well? Um, Twitter, Twitter is my favorite um, because I'm familiar with it and I know the power behind it. I feel like that's what, kind of where crypto lives. Um, right now we're hosting like maybe like one to um, Twitter spaces a week. I would like to have one or two of those a day. Um, I feel like when we do that, that's when we get a lot of new followers and that kind of stuff. So I want to kind of focus on that. Um, I need to get more people on the team that are good at hosting Twitter spaces. So we do that kind of stuff. Some are going to be more light. Some we're going to need more tech people like Greg and Norman are not there to, you know, answer hard questions that maybe not everybody on the team can answer. Um, the forum is great. Um, I, I, I basically, as we gain more followers, I want to direct people to our forum because the difference with our forum is if there's something you want to look up or talk about, um, you can search it and you can find a post that's years old. So, and it's nice, it has a nice thread, um, nothing gets lost. So, stuff like this we could not share in our Telegram because it would be gone in a day, you know, the way things get buried. So. I think we need to basically focus on doing whatever's best for that platform. So, you know, Telegram is a place where people like to gather and talk a bit, but it does get buried. So, yeah, we need to focus on getting more people here, mainly, in my opinion. Telegram will be great for what we're doing today, you know, growing the show. Um, Twitter, you know, we just need all that engagement. We need to get people, more people connected. Um, we need more content. We need more content creators. We need people to know what we can do. Um, we have so much technology, not just with Intercoin, but a culmination of Intercoin and Cubix that the average person doesn't know about yet. So we need to get that out there. Um, there's platforms like Facebook and that that maybe are not the most crypto friendly, but we need to you know find a way of getting more activity there as well. So right now, we're basically just building this team and we're growing. Exactly, exactly. I really hope that, um, oh yeah, I think next week or one of these weeks, we're gonna talk about community building. And so this time we're talking about coins and I touched on community, but because the Intercoin app will integrate with Telegram, like natively, um, we're gonna be able to have a Telegram bots. We're gonna be able to help communities in Telegram essentially manage their uh, you know roles and permissions on chain we're going to have ways to reward people for bringing new members to the community and whoever brought them is going to earn the some coins and then the community can airdrop coins to their people so basically we have a secret weapon that i think nobody else has right and that is any community that we go to, any influencer on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, any Reddit forum, pretty much anything or anyone, we can pro provide for them both the uh, free, like, um, you know, uh, we've built already websites like I've shown with the Token Society, but we can provide for them not just the um, app uh, like we see here. Uh, Radio Show gets an app. People earn the coin for listening to it. 
uh, they earn the coin for inviting others. They earn the, they can create clips and they can invite others with the clips. In or test rule. All of this is already done. Like literally our secret weapon is that we give you your own app. We give you your own coin and people earn the coin. And then you talk about your own app and your own coin. But you say, by the way, Intercoin sponsored, like it was powered by Intercoin. So rather than, you know, just having your website where the sponsors go ahead and, you know, build uh, and, and, and pay you, which we have, rather than doing that, they're going to be able to earn and buy your coin and earn it for doing things that you need them to do, like start a local chapter, right? Like the Yang Gangs that we have here. Um, guess what? We talk to the forward party, they might have a forward coin. And so all of the local chapters like Yang Gangs, uh, they'll be able to have like, for example, this lady right here in Arkansas. Uh, where is it? Um, the, the, the Andrew Yang, Arkansas. She, the real lady is, uh, she is actually a volunteer, innkeeper, founder of the Arkansas Yang Gang. All right. She can go ahead and build up her sub uh, Arkansas thing, you know, Yang Gang over there, and she can set up uh, meetings and events and all kinds of things and use the Yang coin, right? Uh, use the, in this case, the Yang coin or the forward coin or whatever. And so our secret weapon is that most of these influencers would normally charge us. They would say, pay us in, not in your own token even, but go ahead and raise some money from investors and give us that money. And then we will shill your project, right? I don't like that word shill because shill implies that you don't really believe in it. You're just being paid to, to shill it, right? To, and they used to call it endorsements, right? Endorse this cereal or whatever. They don't really eat that cereal necessarily, right? But what if they are eating the cereal? What if they are using Intercoin as step one? We don't come to them and say, please, can you uh, promote our project and we'll pay you with dollars, right? That's, that's mercenary. No, we come to them and we say, how would you like to have your own coin and your own app? And why? Because your members, your fans can connect. So literally that's what our presentations look like. Here's a presentation for the Yang app. We say, you're on social media, but having your own app means that you can control the message instead of competing in a sea of noise. You help people to create memes and bring others to your site. You help to build a movement and reward people for bringing others. You help organize community leaders, thought leaders who believe in the same values as you do, but you let them speak instead of speaking yourself like we're doing right now. Help people form their own connections. When you have events on the ground, right? This is going to become important if you have an online thing. Uh, you can actually have uh, what? Ooh, one one second. I apologize. Let's say. Hey, can you call me back in about ten minutes? Hello, Peter Zwanya. Okay, so um, you can have real life events happening, and you can pack the venues without ever having set foot in there. So the Yang campaign could find out that locally in Kansas. Some people are big fans of Andrew Yang. Taylor Swift can find out, or Kanye West can find out, he has a lot of fans in a certain area that he'd never even set foot. And he lets them organize the event. He lets them organize group rides in rural areas that they can drive each other. And then all of a sudden, he's got this map that says, okay, this is where you've got your supporters, and you can target your efforts. You can come and play a concert anywhere where they earned enough coins and they've done enough and bring you there in person. That's the kind of thing that we can build and we can help grassroots grow up from the bottom, from the ground and meet Kanye West, who is like extending from the top his app and the app helps the grassroots happen from the bottom. So whether it's, you know, Kanye West running for president or Andrew Yang running for president, this can be used for political campaigns, but it can just as easily be used for any um, influencer. So I really think that the efforts that we have 
Honestly, as a team, we have not been as successful as many of the shit coins in the space. I mean, you know that, we know that. We have focused on the substance. But now that we have the substance, we're going to build and deploy our secret weapon. And that weapon is viral growth through existing NFT uh, communities, existing YouTubers and TikTokers and everything. Give them value first. Make them happy first. And then they will promote their own coin and they will promote Intercoin because they used it. They're not going to shill it. They're not going to fake endorse it for money, but they're actually going to live it and they're going to appreciate it and they're going to build their community on top of our platform. So basically, I'm not worried about getting like marketing a year from now, half a year from now. I'm not worried about that. I'm just thinking maybe we should get some marketing in the next month through manual like methods, right? That we've been doing. But at the end of the day, like I'm not worried because in about two months, three months from now, our app is going to do all the work for us, right? The platform is going to grow itself, hopefully. Um, I really believe in that. And I don't just say things, right? If I'm saying something like, I think this platform is going to start growing virally and exponentially, then I see a path exactly how to make that happen. So that's where we are. And I think that if we don't do this right now, if we don't all pull together, then we're going to live in a world where Facebook, Amazon, and federal governments, and everything has already been built in the last 30 years, is going to issue their coins and their things. And we're going to go right back to living in their worlds. These influencers are living in their worlds. They can be deplatformed. They can be whatever. So I see a world where people are essentially in charge and communities of people are in charge. And I just want to say the last thing is that I've been talking about this for years before Andrew Yang ran before anything. I was talking about universal basic income. I was talking about software that helps communities unite. And basically, um, I think that all of us that believe in basic income or believe in grassroots movements, direct democracy, or believe in technology like Bitcoin, I think all of us, our smart contracts, need to work together. It's very easy to say, look, who else is investing? I don't see anyone investing, so I'm not going to invest. Or to say, hey, I don't see this thing marketed like student coin was marketed like everywhere, right? Uh, yeah, that's the thing is all the money that goes in is used for that. All the marketing that we need to do has to be paid for, for now. But in the next two, three months, that is going to change. All the money is going to go much further. All the marketing effort is going to go 10x because our app is going to automate all of it. And it's going to let existing communities almost like hijacking their, you know, their their popularity because we're giving them something that no one else has stacks doesn't have it city coins doesn't have it the money is there new york city coin is here but <laughs> the applications are not so we're coming with the apps we're coming with the applications that's what 2022 will be all about stay tuned so if anyone wants to say anything definitely ask otherwise i think that's a good way to end it Alicia, did you have any questions or anything you want to share? Hi, everyone. Uh, Alicia Anglin here. I just, I, I'm listening to everything and taking everything in. And this is by far going to bring so many communities together. And instead of depending on these elite, elitist, you know, uh, basically the government, depending on them, you know, I'm an NFT artist, abstract artist. I want to create my own coin and have our own community and everybody is able to, um, you know, use this and, and use this as not only, you know, not only for a transaction, you know, just, just everything. I mean, this is like, I'm just taking it all in right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I definitely, uh, definitely going to do my best on 
my end where I'm going to spread the word to artists and get more people, you know, involved. And I think that's what's going to grow our community, especially artists. You know, I went from being traditional, professional, you know, abstract art in the physical world to now doing mostly NFTs and it's completely changed everything. So um, I'm all about it. And, you know, I, I appreciate everything that you've spoken about today. It's definitely opened, opened everything up and I appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you, Alicia. No, it's really, I'm really, this is the thing I love the most, like honest, you know, reactions people have to what we're doing. Because look, at the end of the day, it could be another project about number goes up, you know, in, invest in our thing to earn more of the thing. But at the end of the day, like, that's what everyone is sucked into because of the incentives of profit motive. And I think that if we serve the people around the world and we give them the tools, we're going to make lots of profit. We're all going to make a lot of profit, but we're going to actually do it the right way, which is selling a product to people that they need and not just selling them a dream of making more money with something that has no utility, you know? Absolutely. And, and I believe in slow and steady organic growth rather than jumping into 10,000, you know, uh, dumping all this money into this, this and that, you know, I've seen other projects and other, you know, companies do that. And it's just like, you know, I would much rather be in something that I believe in and I believe in Intercoin and I believe in the, you know, the meaning and everything behind it that I would much rather use my time to not even so much invest, but actually spread the word about it, you know, rather than, you know, these other, you know, I see these other shit coins and I see what they're doing and they have these big communities and they're, pumping and dumping. And it's like, you know, this isn't about pumping and dumping. This is about helping each other in so many different communities that actually need it. Like I'm here in Phoenix. I'm originally from New York. I mean, there are so many things that can be done with this. And it's so like in the beginning, you know, I mean, this is, this is all so new. So I'm just, I'm really excited about it. Beautiful. Beautiful. All right. Well, I think it's a good place to leave it here. Um, I encourage all of you to come back next week. Uh, we're going to be talking about either UBI or community building, and we could get much further into those things. I might be bringing Scott Santons, who's the world's most prolific writer on UBI. He's a friend of mine uh, to this thing, and we're going to talk more about proof of humanity. Albert Wenger, who I talk to from time to time, he's a big proponent of uh, UBI as well, although everybody is sort of like disconnected, and that's what I'm trying to fix, right? I, I might bring people from the forward party or uh, uh, humanity forward, which is a completely separate organization. Um, so basically all these people are passionate about changing the world. Like Albert Wenger wrote this, um, you know, he, he wrote, um, he, he's, a, he, he's part of the Union Square Ventures that invested in Blockstack, invested in this. So, that, you know, I hope that on the one hand, I, you know, they, they, they don't invest in competi competitive companies, but on the other hand, uh, we can work with them and we're not necessarily competing. We're building parts of like the overall solution. So that's coming up next week. I encourage everybody here, when you go out, it takes all of us, right? We need you. It's not about me. It's about all of us. And the thing is, it's about helping the world. So if we can go out and spread the word, you're actually investing in the project because you're investing your personal credibility, right? That you could be spending on something else. You're basically saying, take a look at this. But at the end of the day, I'm letting you know that the next two months are all about building the app, putting it out, and spending all the money on marketing and PR because we have a hundred times more than any shitcoin project. What we don't have is the correct relationships to the right, you know, to do the AMAs, to do the, the this and that, to promote on whatever platform. So that's gonna come, and if you have connections that you wanna bring our way and introduce us, by all means, let's do it. Because at the end of the day, we're ready. We're ready, and 2022 will be a very exciting year with Intercoin. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Hope to see you next week, same time on Wednesday. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Greg.